Hello. So in this video, we're going to talk about Zeno of Ilea, whose work I'm reading out of a pre-Socratics reader. So Zeno, Zeno is a fascinating and infuriating philosopher. Um, he is most famous today, I think, for the idea of Zeno's paradoxes. These are sets of contradictions that Zeno sort of came up with that, on the one hand, reality tells us they don't hold up. On the other hand, there's no logical way to deconstruct them. They, they, they're very, very difficult. Um, and philosophers have been fascinated and infuriated by these paradoxes since the time of Zeno. Um, <clears throat> what what the uh, the editors, um, Patricia Kurd, uh, no, editor Patricia Kurd, says about Zeno in the introduction here, Zeno explores the consequences of Parmenides' claims about what is. He was a follower of Parmenides. Remember, Parmenides, his sort of big philosophical innovation was that nothing changes. He he did not believe in change. And to a certain extent, he sort of maybe meant this literally. It's a little bit difficult to parse exactly what he means. The, uh, the relativists, um, Anaxagoras and Empedocles, they sort of took Parmenides' idea to mean there is a static level at which nothing changes, the amount of matter in the universe. But the combinations of different elements are constantly shifting. Zeno seems to take a different approach. <clears throat> I'll read you the rest of, of what um, Erd says about, about him, or the, the end portion of this. I'm not, I haven't read the whole thing. So he says, his ingenious, that's Zeno's, ingenious, articul um, ingenious arguments purport to show that neither plurality nor motion is compatible with Parmenides' requirements for being, and they have worried and fascinated philosophers from ancient times to the present. First, Zeno showed that the very postulation of a plurality of basic entities leads to difficulties, for if there were many things, or if each thing that is had many characteristics, contradictions would follow. <clears throat> things would be both like and unlike, both infinitely small and indefinitely large. Secondly, Zeno argued against the very possibility of motion or change, showing that the assumptions of such motion results in contradictions. I think contradictions is the key... the key sort of principle for understanding Zeno's philosophy. Um, he, he does, he seems to be doing what I'm, what I, what I would call philosophy with a smirk. Like, yes, he was Parmenides' disciple. He was probably Parmenides' lover. And he believed in Parmenides' basic principle that nothing changes, that, that the universe is basically static. At the same time, Plato records in, um, in the Parmenides, Plato records that Parmenides and Zeno came to Athens to expound their philosophy, and Parmenides argued that everything is one. Zeno argued that Things are not many. And what happens in Plato's dialogue is that Socrates sort of points this out and he's like, aha, it, you seem like you're saying different things, but really you're saying the same thing. And Zeno is basically like, yeah, dumbass, we're saying the same thing. But there is, there is a big difference in a way, right? Because... Parmenides is putting forward his philosophical position that everything is one. Sort of universal cosmic unity. Everything is one. Everything is static. Zeno is saying, hey, 
people have critiqued this idea. They've said, well, but I can see multiple things or they, I can watch things change. Here's why those people are wrong. So Parmenides is sort of putting forward a positive claim in that sense. This is the state of the universe. Zeno is saying, hey, haters, you can fuck off. Here's why you're wrong. Or here, rather, perhaps here's why there are contradictions in the things that you think make perfect sense. So the big two, then, that, that Zeno deals with based on the surviving material and based on what's in, at least what's in a pre-Socratic reader, is the idea of plurality, that there's multiple things, that this computer mouse, for instance, is not the same thing as my glasses, is not the same thing as me, is not the same thing as my shirt, whatever it is. Um, <clears throat> and then the idea of motion, the idea that things move as opposed to everything just sort of remaining static. So the this introduces Zeno's paradoxes. This is where stuff gets tricky. Um, so one of the one of the paradoxes, he says here, if there are many, they must be just as many as they are, and neither more nor less than that. But if they are as many as they are, they would be un they would be limited. If there are many things that are not, uh, if there are many things that are are unlimited, for there are always other things between the things that are, and again others between those, and so the things that are are unlimited. Now, what I take that to mean, um, I have an easier time with. Zeno's is paradoxes of motion than his paradoxes of plurality. But what I basically take that to mean is, right, if you know the movie I Heart Huckabees, there's a scene where um, the firefighter, forget the character's names, um, played by Matt Damon, I think, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but the firefighter has sort of drifted into nihilism. The existential detectives are still in existentialism, and they have this debate about the existence of stuff, right? And the detective points out that in the cracks between stuff is more stuff, right? And so between this computer mouse and my glasses... We don't see anything, but there's stuff. There's, in this case, air here. And so, in that sense, nothing is ever separate. Nothing is ever single. There is no plurality. The firefighter points out that even between those things, there are cracks. Between the air and the computer mouse, there are there there is a gap. And the detective says, and in that gap is even smaller stuff. And the firefighter says, yeah, but between that smaller stuff, there's more, there's even smaller cracks. So this is the idea. The question is, if, if there are gaps that separate off individual bits of matter or whatever it is, then... What is between them? What what constitutes those boundaries, if not other stuff that is then stuff interconnected? So this is sort of the idea. This is this is the the problem, and there's not logically a way around it necessarily. Like it, it's one of those things, and this is part of why I say uh, Zeno does philosophy with a smirk because it doesn't matter for our everyday lives, right? If this computer mouse is the same thing as my glasses, they have in my in my sort of stupid non-philosophical daily existence, they have different utilities. They are different things. I can do do different things with them. I can't see through uh, my computer mouse. I can't control the cursor on my computer with my glasses, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, in that sense, it kind of doesn't matter. Like there is an obvious intuitive way in which the position that Zeno is advocating is wrong, and yet philosophically, there isn't necessarily a good counter-argument to it. 
And I think this is more true with his arguments about motion, which again, and that may just be that for me, they make more sense. So we've got the Achilles paradox, for instance. Um, so it says here, this is from Aristotle's physics. The second is the one called Achilles. This is to the effect that the slowest as it runs will never be caught by the quickest, for the pursuer must first reach the point from which the pursued departed, so that the slower must always be some distance in front. This is the same argument as the dichotomy, but it differs in not dividing the given magnitude in half. Now, part of the reason that I mentioned that this is from Aristotle's physics is um, the excerpts from Aristotle's physics in this collection basically seem focused on this is dumb as hell. <laughs> Zeno's paradoxes are empirically disprovable. If you're a, if you've got a slow runner and you've got Achilles, who's a fast runner, um, even if that slow runner starts halfway down the court, or even if that slow runner starts ahead of, of Achilles, Achilles will overtake that runner. We know that. That's just how it works, right? A modern thing might be, um, I don't know, you put Danny DeVito 100 yards ahead in a 500-yard course, and you put Usain Bolt at the, the proper starting line, Usain Bolt is going to beat Danny DeVito. No insult to Danny DeVito. He's an amazing actor. But Usain Bolt is incredibly fast, right? What Zeno says is, no, that isn't how it works. Because in order for Usain Bolt, Achilles, to overtake Danny DeVito, he first has to cover half the distance, right? But then when he, but then he has to cover half the distance again. There's always half the distance from where he is now. He can never get there. He can never surpass it because there's always half the distance between where he is and where he's trying to go. And again, this is a thing that empirically is not correct. Like Usain Bolt is going to beat Danny DeVito. He's going to overtake him. That's just how it works. But we can't sort of logically say, well, there's a point at which he no longer has to travel half the distance before he can start getting there. So this is the Achilles paradox. And this is kind of tied in with another idea, another paradox of Zeno's, which is um, the sort of paradox of the arrow. And Aristotle uh, talks about this one as well. He says, the third argument is the one just stated, that the arrow is stopped while it is moving. This follows from assuming that time is composed of nows. If this is not conceded, the deduction will not go through. Zeno makes a mistake in reasoning. For if, he says, everything is always at rest when it occupies a space equal to itself, and what is, what is moving is always in the now, the moving arrow is motionless. So basically what, he, what Zeno is saying here is that at any given moment, an arrow shot from a bow is not moving. It can never hit its target because at any given moment it is not moving. Interestingly enough, this kind of anticipates Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. Actually, I, I think this is the interesting thing about Zeno, is that a lot of what he seems to be working through philosophically anticipates the world of quantum physics. But Zeno had no access to the world of quantum physics. And so he's trying to make the, the sort of paradoxes of quantum physics work in a world of Newtonian physics, what we would call Newtonian physics. Um, right? So the in reality, an arrow the course of an arrow can be scientifically measured, right? It can be observed. Um, but we also understand the forces, well, today we do, uh, how much they did in, in 4th century BCE Athens. But we understand the forces of physics at work, we understand geometry, um, we understand things like gravity, etc., etc. You can, if you, if you know the uh, conditions in which an arrow is fired, 
and you know physics well enough, you can chart the exact trajectory of that arrow without actually having to see it fired. That movement is observable. It is demonstrable. It is scientifically predictable. My understanding of quantum physics, bearing in mind that I am not a science guy, I do not know from quantum physics, I have the broadest brushstroke generalizations, my understanding is that it does not work that way at a quantum level. Things are not predictable. And so Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, as I understand it, is rooted in, in the idea that either you can understand the trajectory of a quantum particle, or you can understand, or you can know its location. You cannot know both. How that works, I have no idea, but that is the uncertainty principle as I understand it. Zeno is doing the same thing with an arrow here. The problem is an arrow is not a quantum particle. It doesn't necessarily work the same way. Um, and so because an arrow's motion is I don't and I don't know. I'm not even sure if I'm if I'm right about that. That I mean if we were doing strictly empiricist work and we were going to say, I know where the arrow is now. I could make a reasonable conjecture about where it's going, but I do not know where it's going until I see it go. And if I'm seeing it go, I'm not seeing its location. I don't know. I mean, again, if I knew more about quantum physics, I might have a better answer for this. But I think Zeno's paradox is ultimately not about sort of proving that an arrow can never hit its target or Achilles can never uh, outrun Danny DeVito or whatever it is. The point he's making, I think, is not this is actually right. The stuff that I'm that I'm saying is correct so much as the point is. Those who disagree with Parmenides, those who argue for a plurality of matter, those who argue for the ability of motion within the world, those ideas introduce irreconcilable contradictions at least as great as the contradictions within that, that, that the critics have made of Parmenides' philosophy. So again, I think I think it's less about saying I'm philosophically right or logically right, and more about saying, here's the problems with what you what you think is correct. Philosophy with a smirk.